Hello, you are on the You Watch, I Listen podcast. Who am I speaking with? Hello, my name is Michael Burlingame. Hey, Michael, yes, from 350 Days. I wasn't sure the number, and I didn't remember the time I gave Mike Tomchak, so I'm glad I picked up. <laughs> How are you... <laughs> I, you know, I'm glad I remembered to wake up this morning because I woke up like 10 minutes before we started recording this episode. So, Michael, how are you doing today? Uh, yeah. I'm, do- I'm doing good. Am I speaking to Dan? Yes, this is Dan. I Unfortunately. got my, my co-host Taylor sitting next to me and uh, my engineer Josh and our friend Matt is sitting in with us. Um, I really appreciate you taking some time. I really appreciate you taking some time with us. Um, I just watched uh, your movie that you did the film editing on for 350 days this week. Um, so before we jump into any questions I may have, let me just say I, I truly, I really like like the movie a lot. Um, I'm a I'm a lifelong pro wrestling fan. I've watched just about every documentary you could think of, and the biggest thing I could say about this movie compared to other wrestling documentaries is it didn't get uh, it didn't rely on the the darkness of the, that this industry can bring. It, it more showed the humanity of the wrestlers and what could possibly lead to those dark roads, and, but showed that these guys have real lives, families, and that the the life on the road isn't you know it isn't just fun and games. These guys are getting beat up. They're living in hotels. They're partying. But it, it pulled back the the layers of these you know flamboyant characters and showed the humanity in them. And you did a great job as the editor with showing the flashback videos, the pictures, the music that was uh, used, and it absolutely captured the essence of what the, the story the movie was trying to tell cool. and uh cool. yeah man are you are were you a wrestling fan growing up well you know uh the way i got the gig cuz i didn't know the producers or the director you know they, they i was found, uh by them and uh they were all like uh you know I had a meeting with them and they were sort of like, you know, they knew my what, what I had done, you know, uh, and we talked about that in more detail, you know, my history, which was more in music as far as uh, filmmaking goes. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, once they were, uh, felt that they, they were, they were satisfied, you know, that I was qualified, they got around to the key question and Darren Antola, the creator of the movies, turned to me and he said, well, you know, I guess I should ask, you know, uh, what do you know about wrestling? And I said, well, absolutely nothing. And he turned to his boys and he goes, I think we found our man. <laughs> nice. a, a wrestling fan may have gotten like too personal with it and not actually captured the spirit of what the movie was, the story the movie was trying to tell. Exactly. I know a lot about wrestling now. Yeah. I'll tell well, you that. I'll tell you, the amount of wrestlers that you had in this, I actually wrote down a bunch of them. Um, and because I wanted these guys, I was the only one in here that got to see it. Um, so yeah, Tito Santana, Paul Orndorff, Greg Valentine, Bret Hart, Superstar Billy Grant, Wendy Richter, Georgie Animal Steel, Don Fargo, Jimmy Snuka, Axe of Demolition, Lenny Poffo, Abdullah the Butcher, The Million Dollar Man, Gangrel, Angelo K- uh, King, King Kong Marsh, The Wolfman. Um, uh, you had Angelo um, Savaldi, Stan Hansen, uh, Lex Luger, Judo Jean LaBelle, Marty Jannetty, Nikolai Volkov, Ox Baker. And, you know, the saddest thing I could say about it is the amount of guys that have passed away since you started filming it. Um, it it's it's really eye-opening. Yeah, it's, um, it's like the telephone book of wrestling as far as, you know, how many people are in it. But, yeah, a number of people passed away. Uh, including Ox Baker, uh, yep. George Animal Steel passed away. Uh, a number of them, which was uh, which is unfortunate. But, yeah, J- uh, Jimmy but... Snooker, another one that passed away. And uh, the thing, yeah. one of the Kill big the things I, I was um, when I saw Bret Hart in it. When you, when I see any documentary with Bret Hart, my first assumption is that oh they're going to go into the Montreal screw job and Owen oh, Hart dying. And you, you guys didn't, which I thought was perfect because wrestling fans have heard those stories and seen those stories told ten thousand times yeah. over. It's definitely- been beaten to the ground. And instead, you t- you take this guy and Brett the Hitman Hart, who has one of the most storied careers, uh, third generation wrestler, family still in the business, and one of the best perspectives of the industry. Because while guys around him were going off the rails, he was kind of trying to do his own thing. And he it was nice to see Brett speak about his time in wrestling glowingly, rather than the wrestling with darkness. Like that's one of the documentaries about him. And um, you ca- you captured that one. I mean, you even went into like the midget wrestling and stuff, which I thought was cool. You had one of the the midget wrestlers in there telling his story, and I thought that was fantastic as well. Yeah, he was great. You know, he he just uh, he just had this wide eyed wonder about the life that he had led and stuff, and it was great. And Bret Hart, of course, was great. 
movie. Uh, the associate producer for, for the movie, Evan Ginsberg, who also did the same on, on The Wrestler, uh, that movie. Love that movie. Uh, pointed out, pointed out that, yeah, it's great. Pointed out that Brett, uh, Brett brought like this kind of really sober, reflective look back on his career that was tinged with humor uh, here and there. But, uh, you know, he brought like Gravitas to it, which happens to be the name of our distributor, Gravitas. Oh, wow. Just, course, that way. And uh, then, so Billy Graham was kind of the opposite. He looked back on his life with uh, mirth and humor, and he was constantly just sort of chuckling over even like the worst incidents that ever occurred to him. Yeah. So Evan said, you know, these two guys, these guys, they're like the, uh, they're like the, the, the theater masks, you know, of the tragedy comedy masks, you know, that you're at the end of the Three Stooges and stuff, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, that, that sort of bookend the movie, and all the other wrestlers fill the gap in between that sort of comedy tragedy, well, and they all bring absolutely. something different to it. And I, I'd say with Su Superstar Billy Graham, one of the things that I appreciated about him is how honest he was about the use of steroids in the industry. You, you know, it's one of those things, the guys that usually talk about using steroids are, you know, they're bitter towards the industry. And Superstar Billy Graham doesn't come off as bitter. I know he's he's been somewhat outspoken about some things in WWE, but if anyone can do it, you know, he's one of the most influential people in this industry ever. And the fact that he was talking about how the, he had one of the best physiques, he had one of the original, like, statue esque physiques in wrestling and he's like I'm not getting built like that without doing steroids and steroids for years and years and probably still are such a, a crucial pillar in professional wrestling I mean these guys like the title of the movie they're on the road 350, 350 days a year how could they not use steroids to maintain their sanity their health and not be hurting all the time exactly Billy Graham was uh, very pragmatic about it and you know what it brought to him and uh but it took away from him. Yeah, and... <laughs> One of the other great storytellers in the movie was uh, the brother of Macho Man Randy Savage, Lenny Poffo. And one thing I love yeah. about him is I don't know if anyone it seems happier or speaks more glowingly about what the industry has given to them in life than Lenny Poffo. And it, the, the way yeah. he speaks is so animated um, and bright. And, you know, that's the thing that this balanced so well. You know, Jimmy Snookers was um, somewhat somber considering he just passed. And, you know, there's all the controversy about the, the murder he may or may not have committed years prior and to see like just you know the the layer of humanity as i stated earlier and how important it was to him the first time his mother saw him wrestle on tv and the emotion that brought him i'm like no matter what you think of the guy his mother that's her son and to show that this meant something to these family members and then on the other side of the coin wendy richter one of the original fabulous ladies of wrestling are the gorgeous ladies of wrestling was saying how her father didn't talk to her after she left to go wrestling um, and I thought, yeah. I thought you know, you got two sides of the coin there. But again, the movie did such a good job of not going down that route of the darkness, the despair, and the guys that everyone that dies. The only one in the movie that I thought, like when I saw him, I was like, yeah, I know this guy is messed up, and he looked messed up when he was being interviewed. Was Marty Janet, uh, Marty Janetti? Um, yeah. He he seemed very out of it, but we also know that there's a history of that with him. Yeah. Uh, well, starting with Jimmy Snuka. Um, I thought that, that, you know, despite, you know, allegations and things, uh, his, the personality that he brought to it was one of sort of childlike wonder, Absolutely. which I thought was very interesting. Um, and you mentioned his mother, which, I mean, anytime that guy mentioned his mother, I said, this is going into the movie, even if it doesn't make sense, because the devotion that he shows there it was authentic. to family and mother it's incredible um, and that connection you make between uh, Wendy uh, as the other side of the coin with her family yeah that's a very interesting point that you make there and as far as Marty goes yeah I think maybe he was a little bit out of it I wasn't there you know I wasn't involved with the shooting part of the thing but you know he had some things to say that had to go in regardless Absolutely. of his, his state of mind and he, you know he, also, he's very funny, and uh, oh, yeah. that's one thing <clears throat> you mentioned. You've seen a lot of wrestling documentaries, and I think this one probably has more humor than all the wrestling combined, right? 
Absolutely. It didn't, it didn't, it, like I said, it didn't go too dark at any point. And every time I thought it was going that way, it pulled you back in. And the layers, yeah. of, layers of humanity to each one of the, the superstars that was interviewed was authentic and genuine. And, you know, the, uh, the Marty Jannetty part, it mostly made me laugh. Cause he's like, you know, I had this partner that uh, I rolled with and we always partied. I'm not going to say his name, but me and Sean had a great time. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, there you go, Mark. Because he's, he's been one that's, you know, he's a guy that probably should be in the WWE Hall of Fame as one of the rockers. And unfortunately, his own demons prevented that. And that's a lot of guys in the industry. And, you know, there's certain guys that were in this that you could say the same thing about. Abdul the Butcher has burned a lot of bridges wrestling with hepatitis C and not telling his opponents. But there's no doubting that he's one of the most influential type of wrestlers there's ever been. You know, one of the original true violent wrestlers. Um, you know, Million Dollar Man, who he really went into... The, the mistakes men make that have wives and children with women on the road and the story he told about his wife saying I'm going to try to make this work leaning on her faith I thought that was uh, beautiful I thought it was uh, incredibly well done um, he's one of the best people to hear talk about that because he's a guy that really turned a lot of things in his life around the million dollar man well I think uh, in that little segment there where he spends about maybe a minute and a half sort of encapsulating what you just said. It's kind of like we boil the price of fame down to 45 seconds and get the whole story in. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That movie. I mean, absolutely. And a lot of the wrestlers, they talked about how their family lives were ruined by it. And some, you know, it seemed like they blamed the wrestling industry. And then some said, no, like, we, we chose to do this, you know. And um, one of the things Bret Hart talked about was when they started testing for cocaine. And and our, our test, they started testing for weed. And they're like, you can't smoke weed anymore. And Brett's like, oh, the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to be drinking and doing pills. And that's really when the epidemic started. Uh, you know, they, they said no to one thing, which meant that, that you're clear to do anything else. And it's been most of these guys, it's been opioids and then booze that kill them. Um, and, I, you know, you, you captured all the, the angles that this could possibly come from. And, uh, you know, you said that th you weren't a wrestling fan and you mostly worked on music documentaries. So was this like a huge change from what you normally work on? And uh, what kind of challenges did you have in doing that? Well, I did work with Bret Hart in the early 90s and Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. Wow. Uh, Paul Bear, I think. Uh, I directed a music video for, for the WWF that was called something like We're All Together Now. I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, me and my buddy are shaking okay. our heads like we, we go deep with our old school wrestling <laughs> in the, the cheese era, but I remember that very well. Yeah, all these metal guys, heavy metal guys, and then, and then the wrestlers and yep. stuff. Yep, yep. <laughs> we were just running around, and I was like, I remember we were in Washington Square Park, and I didn't know who Bret Hart was at the time. Uh, I found out pretty quickly because, man, when he walked into Washington Square Park on a Saturday afternoon, it was like President of the United States walked in there, you know? Yeah, he was it a big was star. Unbelievable. Yeah. And a, a few years earlier, um, I made a film with Killer Kowalski as well, so I had a couple of uh, experiences. In fact, there's a clip from that film in 350 days uh, with Killer. Yeah, can, I mean, um, go on. Oh. So coming from a music background, uh, uh, I didn't feel like there was a lot of difference. You know, a star is a star, you know? Yeah. Uh, basically, the, you could just plug this in full of uh, people like Bruce Springsteen and whoever, and they could tell the same stories, you know? Yeah. It's, it's just a, a story that, that people share, basically, no matter what you do, as, as long as you're... You make sacrifices to get to the top, you're going to have these kind of stories no matter what your profession is. But uh, I think there's a music sensibility to it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, th as you said, you know, th that's that's a great point, doing, like, a music documentary. Even in music documentaries, you know, the music may be the, the crutch of the film, but you're trying to tell a story about the, the struggles on that tour with uh, whether it's bandmates or whatever or just from date to date and how they get through it. So it is, I guess it is very, very similar. Um, what, what was your favorite mo movie or thing that you worked on specifically? Do you have one that, like, sticks out in your mind? What was the favorite movie I worked on? Yeah. Uh, this one, <laughs> I did a couple of others that I that I like as the editor. Uh, one which hasn't been released yet uh, is about a, a, a photographer 
you know, a known photographer whose work is like in, in, in the Museum of Modern Art and other places like that, uh, who slowly over the years uh, progressively uh, was going blind. Uh, oh, and wow. it's about his stress to continue working even to the point where he actually completely blind and still taking pictures. Wow, that's that. When, when is that one coming out? That's actually one that I really like. Cool. Cool. What, when, when, do, when does that one drop? I, I, I'm not hearing you there, uh, what, Dan. When, when is that movie coming out about the photographer? Uh, we don't know yet. It's called The Tears of Apollo, and we're not quite sure. Uh, editing has been completed, but um, we're not really sure where we're going. The director's name is John Spellos. Okay. And uh, it's a film. Okay, yeah, that's one I'm definitely interested in checking out. That'd be um, cool. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I, I, um, you know, our buddy uh, Mike Tomchek set this up for us. Um, when I saw that the movie was out, I was like, I, I was gonna watch it regardless if my friend worked on it or not, because I like watching all this stuff about the an industry that I really, really love. Um, and it's doing fantastically so far on uh, the iTunes charts, on Amazon. I saw that it was number one in sci-fi downloads. I'm like, I don't know if this is science fiction, but uh, <laughs> um, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Evan Ginsberg, because uh, uh, Mike sent us an email and he said, what the H? But he goes, but, but I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. Number one in sci-fi movies. And Evan Ginsberg said... Uh, you know, that's because it's Ox Baker's from another galaxy. <laughs> yeah, Ox Baker was out there, man. He's a, he was an interesting guy. Very, uh, still very loud and flamboyant and everything. Uh, he was uh, one of my favorite ones in the movie. Um, and yeah. how, how this movie must have been getting worked on for a while because a couple guys were in it that passed away a while ago. Um, and so, what, when did you guys start working on this? Well, let's see. Uh, the director, Fulvio Cesare, yesterday sent uh, an email and he had a picture of Greg Valentine holding the slate, the production slate. So, and it was uh, six years ago to the day, yesterday, that they shot Greg. Greg okay. was not the first, but I think it was at least six or seven years ago that they started shooting. And the editing was about a, uh, eight months of continuous editing and then two or three more months of sort of like finesse editing that wasn't necessarily eight hours a day every day. But for the first seven or eight months, it was seven days a week, full time. Wow. You know? And how long have you been working uh, on film editing specifically? When did you break into this industry? Well, I was directing in Boston and we were doing music videos. We were set up, uh, remember that group, The Cars? Of course, yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, so we were set in their studio. They gave us like a room where we could do production. So we were doing work for them. I was making my own films and stuff. And uh, this one guy who was my director of photography, he moved to New York and he was trying to get work again in music video. This was in the early 90s. And he started to become successful by showing his reel, which basically was a lot of work that I had directed, but he had shot. So some people, once they get past how, how the lighting was and stuff and wanting to hire my buddy, they said, well, who directed that, by the way? So I started to get, as a result, and ultimately I had to move to New York, and I just fell right into the, basically, they would put me on the road with rock bands to do behind-the-scenes documentary work as a one-person crew. You probably, saw some usually... you probably saw some wild shit doing that. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I, I, I did more than see wild shit. <laughs> you, part, you partook <laughs> in the festivities. Well, you know, the way I was saying, the, the roadies get more than the rock stars, and I figured, well, maybe the cameraman can get more than the roadies. <laughs> That's a good point, man. All right, so, um, again, I, I really appreciate you taking some time with us. We have two questions for every single one of our guests, and I'm going to ask you them as well. Um, our show is called You Watch, I Listen. Um, we're based in movies and music, so the first question is, what's your favorite movie? Jeez, my favorite movie of all time? Yes. Well, uh, I would have to say it's Steamboat Bill Jr., which is the Buster Keaton film. I'm going to write that down because I, I, you know, you working, it's called Steamboat Bill Jr. Jr. I'm going to check that out. Um, and the other question is, it's very hard to pick out a favorite album, so I think it's better if I say, what's your favorite band and your favorite album by that band? But first, can I tell you my favorite talkie? 
Sure. The silent film. Sure. Uh, a clockwork orange. Oh yeah, well that's okay. can't go wrong with that. That's one I watch at least once a year. I go, I go, I just like a few months ago I went through a total Kubrick kick and watched every single one of his movies. So um, uh, I, yeah, yeah. I will always uh, love Clockwork Orange. Um, so yeah. your, your favorite band and your favorite album by that band? <laughs> I guess I would definitely have to go um, pretty obvious here and say the Beatles, and I would have to choose between the White Album and, and Rubber Soul. Those are my two. I'm go with Ru- Those are my two favorite Beatles, Beatles albums. Two. Yeah, I'm going with Rubber Soul. So like, we, we we did a whole segment on the show where we um um me and the the original co-host of the show we listened to every Beatles album and then we ranked them and my number one was Rubble, Rubber Soul and two was White Album so I'm with you right there entirely. Yeah, see, um, I'm, so, I'm, I'm a Sergeant um, Pepper guy. Wow. Uh, Michael, yeah, I'm happy audition then. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, but Michael, I really appreciate you taking some time with us. Uh, again, the movie is 350 Days. It's available on Amazon, iTunes, uh, most streaming platforms to rent and buy. Um, so, again, thank you very much for spending some time with us. You did a kick-ass job on this movie. Great. Thanks, Dan and Taylor and the rest of you folks. Thanks a lot. It was nice talking to y'all. You, you too, man. Have a great Have a weekend, one, man. Right?